Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. We turn 18 this year. I'm Shireen Bhan. Last week, the Indian startup and business ecosystem faced some harsh truths after bidding farewell to Cathy Coffee Day founder VG Siddharth. While the turn of events has raised several concerns, but the one that we are trying to address through this program is the structure of private equity deals, the challenges as well as the learnings. Now, according to an EVI report, at $1.4 trillion of PV, PE and VC investment uh, well, we've seen coming into India in 2018 has been the best year that we've seen for the sector in India since 2007. Globally, 2019 has started on a strong note with $11.4 billion of private equity and VC investments just in the first quarter eclipsing the previous Q1 high of 2018. The report further suggests that India is well positioned to attract a disproportionately higher share of this mountain of global private capital that's looking for alpha returns. As one of our panelists, Gopal Srinivasan, managing partner TVS Capital Funds, points out that private capital pools offer many classes of assets, from venture to private equity, to venture debt, to promoter funding, to hybrid instruments. But as an entrepreneur, how does one choose between each of these different instruments? Also, is this a time for the VC and private equity community to reflect on deal structuring and the role of patients? capital. We discussed the downside of too much debt, the asymmetry in investment negotiations, the challenges of structured debt instruments and more with Gopal Srinivasan, Managing Partner at TVS Capital Funds, Puneet Dalmia, Managing Director at Dalmia Bharat Group, Padmanabh Sinha, Chairman at IVCA and the Managing Partner Tata Opportunities Fund, Ravi Gururaj, President of Thai Bangalore, Alok Mittal, Co-Founder and CEO of Indifi Technologies and Chris Gopalakrishnan, Chairman of Axelor Ventures and the Co-Founder of emphasis. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on the program. Mr. Srinivasan, let me start by asking you. Uh, you know, you've written a note where you say that investors should not be punished based on one-off events. But if I were to pick up on what we've seen happen with VG Siddhartha's unfortunate death uh, and the manner in which the events have started to play out post that. Now, we don't have adequate information, so I don't want to get into speculation about uh, what kind of deals or private debt he had to deal with. But what, to your mind, are the biggest lessons or the takeaways from the VG Siddhartha story? The story of a wonderful man is that we need to create an equity culture in this country where people are very comfortable mm. with the idea of raising large amounts of equity not get too concerned about what percentage they control in their companies and certainly not resort to borrowing money against their shares to shore up their holding position in this company. Today we live in this volatile world where we are like a raft going down through a white water rapid. We are hurled to and fro. That's the world. It's not going to change. So we must be prepared to deal with volatility. What better way than equity which is patient, which is a buffer, like an inflatable right mm. raft. Debt is very fragile and I think that is the single big message. Yeah. Don't have to control 51%. Mm. Happy to control some majority. And mm. today, that I think is the direction we should discuss more of in this program. Okay, Alok Mittal, I want to take that point forward where uh, Gopal Srinivasan le left off. The debt is very fragile. He also talks about the fallacy of the Indian promoter's curse. Promoters embrace the double jeopardy of wanting to be in control, the magic number of 51%, as was being pointed out there by Gopal, uh, while also believing that their equity is undervalued by the market. So, Alok, how does one move forward from this? Sorry, I've lost the audio line. Alok, can you... Okay, I'll come back to Alok in just a second, but I, I, let me go across to Chris Gopalakrishnan. Uh, Chris Gopalakrishnan, the fact that debt is very fragile was the point that was being made there by uh, uh, Gopal Srinivasan. Also, uh, this business of which the question that I was just putting to, uh, uh, to Alok, the promoter, the Indian promoter's curse of promoters wanting to be in control uh, while also believing that their equity is undervalued by the market and hence falling perhaps into the debt trap. What is, what is the way out from here and what would your advice be? See, first of all, you know, this is a very 
unfortunate event and um, we are all very saddened by what happened. Uh, so my request to all the people seeing this and you know, to media especially, uh, first of all, <clears throat> we need to make sure that you know, people reach out and connect with others uh, you know, before they take an extreme step. Now having said that, uh, to yes. answer your question, see clearly over leverage is a big problem. You know, we, we must make sure that mm. um, you know, we calibrate the, uh, the debt to the growth, even if the growth is a little slower. We have a long runway ahead. Mm. India is going to continue to grow for many years in the future. And so we need to actually calibrate our growth and take on debt to, to match that growth and not over leverage ourselves. Mm. Now this requires actually both the, the company as well as actually the, uh, the, the investor or the lender to actually have some models, some benchmarks, some um, hmm. rules <coughs> regarding how much debt they will give out, etc. And as Gopal clearly said, we are living in a very, very volatile uh, world where the future is uncertain because of many things some under our control but many things hmm. are beyond our control and that's the reason why you have to take on debt that you can service it is very very important to do that and and second and <clears throat> as you as you take further rounds of funding you know series b series c series d yeah. or you know the um, hmm. you know the round before the ipo uh, you can actually dilute, you know, yeah. for example, uh, the founders at Infosys had about 13-14% equity, right? So you can actually dilute mm. and, uh, and, and bring in more investors. Mm. Okay, uh, let's talk about this business of oh, being over leveraged, uh, uh, debt being fragile, and let me now go across to Paddy. And Paddy, uh, you know, while we've talked about uh, the benefits of what we've seen happen in India and of course globally as well uh, with the advent and the, uh, uh, the momentum that private equity has brought in, the kind of ecosystem that we've been able to develop here uh, in India. But how much of true blue private equity investment are we now seeing in India versus things like mezzanine or structured financing? Uh, and the concern really is how much of the private equity deals which ostensibly seem like private equity are debt masquerading as private equity? Sure. So actually, in, in the Indian context, the majority, the bread and butter of private equity is what we call venture growth and expansion capital. Venture growth and expansion capital means mm -hmm. really investing as a minority shareholder alongside the founders or the entrepreneurs or the uh, promoters, whatever you may call them, as the majority shareholder, and funding the company for its growth and expansion while keep, you know, keeping that goal of keeping uh, leverage modest as you grow. So typically, uh, hmm. PEVC funds will invest for a four to six year horizon. It might, uh, you know, turn out to be longer. India, uh, by the global investors, has often been accused of, of having a longer cycle of exits in the past, which is remedied in the last few years, perhaps. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, one uh, key role that PEVC investors do there in those four to six years that they stay invested hmm. is alignment of interest with the promoter, coming to the other major learning. Hmm. Because they are minority shareholders, it's in their best interest to have alignment of interest. What that means is they will stay invested four to six hmm. years, they'll, they will try and improve capital efficiency, bring in focus, uh, grow faster than the market, uh, institutionalize and professionalize the business, but eventually their goal is to prepare the company hmm. for an exit after that period of time because ultimately they have a fiduciary responsibility to return money to their investors which could be pension funds, endowments, foundations, yeah. whosoever, financial institutions, insurance mm. companies. So, mm. you know, the alignment of interest comes in the fact that it's in their interest, just as it is in the founder's interest to create a sustainable and valuable business, mm. such that they'll get an exit. And the exit mm. from an alignment of interest perspective is never in the form of a put to the promoter, because if you are putting to the promoter, you are on opposite yeah. sides of the negotiating table. Yeah. On the other hand, if it's an IPO, mm. if it's a sale mm. to a financial investor or a sale to a strategic investor, you are fully aligned with the promoter, founder, mm. entrepreneurs. So that's uh, important and mm. that's typically the goal of uh, private equity venture capital investors. 
to your question of do other forms happen? Yes, of course. There is, uh, uh, as you referred, there is promoter financing, but that's not just done by private equity venture, private equity firms. A lot of it is actually done by NBFCs. Mm. In the past, even mutual funds have been there. But yeah. I don't think it's anybody is, yeah. has any confusion on their minds that that is quasi debt. That's not private equity. Uh, so the bread mm. and butter remains mm. private equity. And uh, key learning there, apart from you know the point my fellow panelists made about having enough capital, optimal capital structure, uh, is about alignment of interest, mm. which is the point I referred to you. The preferred forms of exit mm. are either an IPO or a secondary sale to financial or strategic investors. Yeah. Well, so far we haven't uh, gone the IPO route, uh, uh, you know, sparingly, if at all. Uh, uh, so it is about uh, uh, exit by way of financial investors. But uh, uh, Alok Mittal, let me come to you now. And, and you know, this point that you have raised, Alok, uh, previously as well, uh, to take off from what Paddy was saying, that there seems to be an asymmetry in investment negotiations. Now, how do you address that asymmetry in investment negotiations? You propose the idea of an entrepreneurship bill, for instance. Uh, now, post what we've seen happen in the Cafe Coffee Day, uh, BG Siddhartha debacle, uh, there is also regulatory scrutiny or the possibility of regulatory scrutiny with regulators saying, look, we want more disclosures on the part of private equity investors. We want more disclosures from companies on the terms of agreement with private equity investors. How do you see all of this taking shape and what do you believe could be the fallout or the impact of what we've seen happen with BG Siddhartha? Yeah, you know, uh, Shane, uh I would not like to go too deep into this specific case uh, with Mr. Siddharth. Uh, you know, I think what this case has done is to bring to light the issues of conflict of interest, right? Not just alignment of interest. And I agree mm. with the other panelists that at least in upside scenarios, there is a strong alignment of interests. Uh, however, the asymmetry in these negotiations, and I'm purely talking about equity investments, um, you know, arises on several yeah. fronts where many of these agreements are structured in a manner where if everything goes well, then there is uh, alignment of interest. But there is inherent, mm. uh, you know, misalignment and almost an attribution of guilt to the yeah. promoter if things are not going well. And I think the root yeah. cause of that really is yeah. that, you know, private equity and promoters come in many different flavors. And over the past 8 to 10 years, mm. we have seen a lot of mixing up. Right, people who would do control are doing venture growth. Uh, you know, hedge funds are coming and doing mm. venture growth. Uh, and in that mix, I don't think uh, private equity players have necessarily uh, gotten used to the idea of the new Indian entrepreneur, right? I think a lot of us, and you know, I've been in the private equity mm. business, a lot of us are still stuck in yeah. the notion of a promoter who is out to, uh, you know, dupe the investor. And that is how the terms are structured. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so uh, the asymmetry of negotiations and uh, how you sort of move from an alignment of interest when things are going good to a misalignment of interest when things go sour, uh, that of course is an issue that also needs to be addressed. But uh, uh, Puni Dalmia, let me come to you now. As an entrepreneur uh, and as someone who has been in the startup space and as someone who hopes to support the startup space, uh, what would you like to see from here on to continue to build on the momentum that we've seen? Because a lot of good, as I pointed out, has happened courtesy venture capital as well as private equity. What would you like to see now to build on that momentum with safeguards being put in place as well? I think first of all, uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, this whole uh, episode of uh, Mr. Siddharth has, uh, you know, clearly come as a shock to all of us. And uh, I knew him personally as a very bold visionary a very hard-working guy and a super yeah. helpful and a very soft-spoken person. So, you know, when somebody takes a step like this, it obviously, you know, makes you think as to what are the lessons for entrepreneurs in this whole episode, So, which is a very disappointing yeah. and sad incident. And as I was thinking about it, uh, yeah. you know, I think one question comes is that, you know, there are always uncertainties in business. And nowadays in the world where yeah. You know, there are political uncertainties, there are economic uncertainties, uh, and there are so many things that you cannot forecast and the world is moving very fast. So entrepreneurs are by nature very positive and they, uh, you know, think that the mm. future will sort itself out and generally 
they otherwise they can't survive yeah. so they have a optimistic view of the future but given that the world is changing so fast i think one question is that forget over leverage should you over equitize your business model you know and we are seeing with insolvency mm. law okay. with uh, you know put options yeah. and with the structured debt which which is like uh, equity masquerading as debt i think it just um, these yeah. are like um, uh, you know it just puts too much pressure and i think one question to think about is should you over equitize mm. your business and i think the second question mm. uh, okay. i really think is how do you build internal capacity to handle uncertainty and i think mm. uh, this is another area mm. where how can you develop a social network how can you develop some uh, you know spiritual habits in your daily routine whether it is meditation whether it's yoga <laughs> because the world will always be uncertain yeah. and can you can you insulate yourself yeah. from all this uncertainty so i think there are two yeah. questions for me one is over equitize second is develop some daily routines and a social network to to help yourself and relax mm. and finally the question that you asked yeah. on how to build yeah. on this momentum i think just having a great chemistry between investors and an entrepreneur is very important so can mm. you be totally transparent mm. can you mm. share bad news ahead of uh, you know so people somebody told me the bad news should take the escalator and good news should take the stairs so i think uh, just yes. sharing everything that's yes. going on with total transparency also gives you a lot of support sometimes we like i mean people like to hide bad news and in that case they try to they won't get yeah. the full support that's required when the bad news is fully disclosed so i think this is another yeah. thing to build on momentum that no, create a total quest, uh, you know uh, uh, environment of transparency where you can share bad news with equal comfort and actually faster than good news hmm hmm yeah you know the stigmatization of failure is something that we will discuss and the the the, the point that you were making about the good news taking the stairs and the bad news taking the elevator uh, is what mr n r narayan murthy drilled into everybody at infosys and i'm sure chris gopalakrishna may may want to share a, a thought or two on that chris uh, uh, you know this is something that mr murthy i know uh, in all my years of interviewing him drilled this into my head and i'm sure he did that uh, to all of you at infosys but uh, that's an important lesson is it not uh, chris especially in an environment where business failure uh, is often stigmatized yeah <clears throat> and we know that uh, in this environment especially when you are a startup you know 7 out of 10 startups are going to fail so if we do not create a culture do not create a climate where you know we accept failures as you know lessons to be learned and you know separate the company from the entrepreneur the entrepreneur will go on to maybe create more businesses and the company must be wound down we need to make sure that it is easy for us to close down the company and go forward the investors also i believe understand mm. so for example when i invest i know that uh, i must invest in companies which can scale up rapidly which can give me superior returns and in mm. spite of that some of them are going to mm. fail i know that so these are very important and as a as a founder i need to also be very clear that there is no golden rule which says that i must take equity i must take external funding i must go for debt you know these are things mm. which have to be very carefully weighed in if you have a business which is going to grow linearly not exponentially linearly mm. probably you need to look for profitability and create a sustainable profitable business you know infosys never to con equity right. from outside we directly went for ipo so uh, and we never took debt yeah. also you know we we said um, we will not take debt except mm. the one instance in the beginning so these are you know lessons i think we need to talk about of course if you are if you are going to scale rapidly yeah. if you need working capital you need to you know ensure that you have a model transparency is very important i completely agree that um, yeah. you know the disclosure to investors um you know must be of the highest level and most investors then understand and mm. work with you uh, you're absolutely right in transparency you know, in, you know, uh, you know uh, the story right in pointing out e, 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 <coughs> yes go ahead sir in yeah in 1994 when we lost a very large contract we immediately disclosed that to our investors and it it was yeah. about 25% of our revenues uh, but we made up 
almost all of that but the investors yeah. after that point onwards completely trusted the company and our valuation actually increased because of that absolutely you're absolutely right. Uh, transparency is, uh, uh, cannot be underestimated uh, at all, and it, uh, it must, in fact, be at the heart of, uh, of strategy. But Ravi, let me come to you, because, you know, one of the points that was mentioned earlier, and I know that this is something that you've uh, often spoken about, uh, is this tension in achieving uh, the twin goals of retaining control and yet being able to access capital to scale up. And I think we're seeing a lot of that uh, happen uh, in India today, where uh, startups need growth capital but are unable to hold on to control because they're diluting uh, significant amounts of equity and from the regulatory environment perspective what is it that you would like to see change uh, in order to facilitate you know funding uh, as well as ensure uh, that entrepreneurs can perhaps retain more control Yeah, so I, sh I think, Shireen, there's always this uh, balance between control and, you know, uh, growth, right? Uh, I think there's a huge premium, especially in the last four or five years, we've seen a massive premium attached to uh, exponential growth. And so entrepreneurs, uh, especially those that kind of break into the Sunicorn range and higher, especially in the startup ecosystem, uh, are under tremendous pressure to raise more capital, grow more, uh, you know, at a, at a bigger pace, uh, and, you know, build the footprint out, right, massively. Uh, and this is like a winner-takes-all category winner, uh, and, you know, that's a very important position to be in. And that puts a lot of pressure, right? Uh, I think uh, a couple of things that have hmm. been promulgated have been, one, differential controls for founders so they can hang on to more equity for longer, yeah. uh, like yeah. in some of the Silicon Valley firms that have really scaled up. That's one area. Uh, I think, you know, we also just need to have more ease of capital coming into the country because uh, if there's more competition mm. to mm. fund these companies, uh, I think the terms entrepreneurs will get in a market-driven mm. system will be fairer. Uh, and they'll be, uh, you know, you know hmm. they might be able to tap into better, better terms, right? Uh, I think that's probably where we should go. Hmm. We shouldn't hmm. try to tarnish, broad brush all the investors uh, with this one incident, however tragic it yeah. may be, and however sad we all are about it. I think, you know, we should take the lessons, but not, you know, kind of lay the blame on uh, the, 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 you know, the footsteps of the private equity business. I don't think that's fair, because we need that. All entrepreneurs need is private that, equity capital. Is that this a you know, uh, promoter Ra capital, and we need debt capital too. No. Sure, sure, I get that. But, you know, you raised this issue, and I know that several of you have raised this point as well, that don't, uh, don't let this one incident uh, sort of become uh, the, the barometer with which you judge all private equity or venture transactions in this country. And, and the fear is that we could perhaps see some knee-jerk regulatory action. Is, is that a fear that you currently have, Ravi? I don't, I don't think it's going to happen that way. I don't think it's going to play out that way. I think what we're going to go is we're going to garner a lot of uh, very good insights from uh, this tragic incident. You know, I think on the one hand, entrepreneurs should be realistic in terms of their goals. They should be realistic that failure is, you know, going to happen, as Chris said earlier, in nine out of ten cases, you're going to end up with failure. I think what's jarring for all of us is that yeah. here was a founder who, who had built a, a massive enterprise, had raised massive amounts of capital, had gone IPO, had an iconic yeah. brand across India, had seemingly done everything, mm. right? And still, mm. there was still more to be done, yeah. and there was still the tension internally for him, right? And so uh, that, I think, is a, mm. is a learning moment for all of us. I think we need to all introspect and take away uh, whatever lessons we have, each of us privately, to understand you know, that, that could be the silver lining in this tragedy, right, is that all entrepreneurs yeah. across India uh, use this as a lesson for themselves, right, to moderate, to, to also have realistic mm. goals, right? And at the same time, we expect entrepreneurs to push hard, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I think hopefully it's the same way for investors. Yeah. Uh, in their board meetings, they too will take cognizance of the tensions that may be inherent in the entrepreneurial journey. It's a very lonely journey, and, you know, I think investors can help there too, right? 
uh, that would be the, the assumption that investors are not just acting as money lenders, but are also acting as support systems uh, for entrepreneurs. But Paddy, on the point that was being made there uh, by Ravi, uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, that perhaps make it easier for more capital to come in, that may ensure that there are fairer terms uh, given to entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked about some of the changes that are on the annual DVRs, for instance, the uh, regulator also trying to make it easier for startups to list here in India. What would you like to see change from the regulatory perspective and what needs to be prioritized? I think there are a few interesting uh, things uh, uh, currently being thought about. Uh, one important one is this whole IFSC uh, structure, uh, International Financial Service Centers. Hmm. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity hmm. uh, for India that you can create offshore financial centers you know, potentially in a city like Mumbai. Uh, I think the you know, current issues in places like Hong Kong, if at all, provide an opportunity that India becomes an important uh, uh, center for pooling capital. Uh, so around IFSC, the government has been uh, quite progressive in uh, some of the regulatory framework they have announced, but, uh, but you need to uh, finesse that and also make sure it's there in the hubs of uh, financial activity because financial hubs are really in seven, eight, nine cities in the world, so they won't go beyond those hubs. Uh, yeah. The other bit is uh, being yeah. competitive on taxes. I think uh, you know, with the uh, double taxation agreements going away and capital gains uh, on yeah. listed uh, shares, I think we've got to see what is the extent of tax friction in India for long-term investors because these are providers mm. of risk capital and mm. uh, they will look at their post-tax returns. Uh, we need to show, make sure that's competitive, mm. uh, you know, maybe through these IFSCs if, if there are any tax uh, rebates provided there yeah. or in other forms. Uh, yeah. GST is a big tax friction right now for uh, private equity and venture capital mm. firms because at 18%, uh, that's yeah. a big cost. Yeah. So there is lots to be done. India is hungry for capital. Uh, PVC has been contributing about a 25 mm. to 30 billion dollars run rate now uh, on an annual basis. It's a very yeah. stable form, mm. much more stable than mm. capital markets. But it needs to go a long way if you know, all, you know, our long-term uh, goals of five trillion economy, etc., have to be achieved. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, more regulations, mm. uh, uh, lighter regulations which allow India to be competitive, uh, particularly mm. as a financial center, and taxes to be competitive. Mm. That's, those are the two hours. Uh, Gopal Srinivasan, just to take that point forward, and I know that this was an issue that was taken up in the meeting with the finance minister uh, this afternoon uh, that Indian industry uh, had, uh, and this issue of reducing the cost of equity uh, funding, uh, and that was the point that Paddy was making as well, uh, and you believe that that is truly the need of the hour, especially if you want to avoid the curse, the curse of over-leveraging, which is something that we're seeing playing out across India Inc. today. Uh, you know, what is it that you would like to see happen by way of changes? from here on. I think, Shireen, basically uh, India is investing about 1% of its GDP in terms of ECPE. For the Prime Minister's dream of a 5 trillion economy to take place, we will require 6-7 lakh crores. It's about three times the current amount of money mm. to be invested in VCPE. And therefore, Paddy's point, which is onshoring capital into India, and improving the rules, for example, whether it's GST yeah. on fees, whether fees are treated as capital costs, yeah. there are two, three small ones. We should never forget that this government, Mr. Modi's government, has given us something like 24 changes which have enhanced the flow of VC and PE in India since they came to power in the first yeah. term. This yeah. is a very VCPE mm. friendly government and they will do the balance. I just want to add one point, Shereen, if I may, in addition to this point, and I think Alok had yes. respond, uh, referred to it. You know, this is risk capital. So the core of this is the assessment of mm. risk by the investor on the investment, the business partner. Yeah. What happens is companies yeah. that are seen yeah. to be attractive, promoters, entrepreneurs are seen to be attractive. We assess them as less risky and mm. they get multiple offers. In fact, there the asymmetry is between one business the one promoter getting many many offers but as we go down because there is yeah. so much of capital flowing in the ones that are more risky or yeah. seen as assessed as less quality tend to get obviously lesser mm. offers and there the relationship tends to be more yeah. in favor of the investor whereas in other cases is more in favor of the promoter mm. so assessment is the core sure. and the assessment creates yeah. a selection bias 
we should be aware that when you are making 20 to 30 transactions a week, which is the current flow in India, hmm. you are going to, there is a spectrum. So we can't take any one case and generalize across the industry. There are more attractive opportunities which attract lots of investors. There yeah. are med somewhere in the center and there are some which attract few because of the flow of capital. So I just wanted to bring out this logic of selection bias perhaps as overarching more than any yes. other asymmetry. Oh, I think that we're seeing that play out here uh, in the Indian startup ecosystem very, very clearly, that selection bias that you speak of. But gentlemen, we need to take a very quick break, but we are going to resume this conversation on the road ahead for private equity and venture capital funding in India, what needs to change, what needs to be done, and also, as we've been pointing out, it is lonely at the top. How do you create that support system? How do you create a network of mentors that actually step in when times are tough? That and more when we return on this Young Turk special. Welcome back. You're watching our Young Turk special and we're discussing the private equity landscape in India, what more needs to be done to encourage it and what kind of guardrails need to be put in place. Uh, also, the perils and problems of excessive leverage and the downsides of taking on too much debt. Still with us on our special, Gopal Srinivasan of TVS Capital Funds, Puni Dalmi of the Dalmi Bharat Group, Padmanabh Sina of IFCA, Ravi Gururaj of Thai Bangalore, Alok Mittal of Indify Technologies, Chris Gopalakrishnan of Axelor uh, Ventures. Uh, uh, Alok, I want to come to you because... Uh, you know, at the start of the program, I talked about an idea that you've been pushing, and that is the Entrepreneur's Bill of Rights, as well as the publication of what you believe are market standards. Why do you think this is important, and what would you like to see being taken forward by way of this Entrepreneur's Bill of Rights? So I think there are really, uh, you know, two key areas where there is an opportunity to improve the standard of relationship between private equity players and entrepreneurs. I think one is the whole area of exit rights, and that still remains a mystery to most of the mm -hmm. founders. Uh, that is also one area which gets progressively negotiated between a term sheet to actual documents, and then you know it is critically dependent on behavior of the private equity players after the investment, because very often these mm -hmm. ideas are sold to entrepreneurs as something that are just on paper for private equity players' protection, but don't get exercised in practice. Right. So I think there is a, a potential to, uh, you know, create an information marketplace uh, so that entrepreneurs know okay. what to expect from respective private equity players. Uh, as I said, there is a segmentation mm. happening between, you know, private equity players as well as entrepreneurs. You know, are you looking to do an LBO? Are you looking to back, you know, a majority promoter? Or, uh, you know, startup founders, which in most cases land up in minority in their companies today. So I think you know, this might enable a better matchmaking uh, uh, between uh, the kind of P players and the kind of entrepreneurs that may self select. I think the second area, and that's where the, okay. you know, my, my notion of the entrepreneur bill of rights, and I don't mean a regulatory bill, uh, you know, just to clarify, hmm. um, comes in is uh, you know, what role should these private equity players play on the boards of companies? Uh, again, in a classic, mm. you know, majority control promoter companies, normally, you know, the PE perspective has been that we are just nominee directors and it's really the entrepreneur who controls and runs yeah. the company. However, in startups, a lot of companies now have majority investor ownership and majority directors on the board of these companies, mm. right? What should be the mechanism mm. uh, to make sure that entrepreneurs are not overexposed uh, to downside risk in this scenario, right? Yeah. So moving beyond the current episode, Hmm. You know, there is still a founder in Bangalore who's been in jail for nine months because the company went insolvent in a disgraceful hmm. manner with all the private equity nominee hmm. board members being on the board of the company, right? The first action on part of the hmm. PE board members was to resign and the entrepreneurs languishing in jail. Now, that's hmm. not what we can promise our entrepreneurs, hmm. especially if we are expecting them to take more hmm. risk and especially if we want to encourage younger founders who may not necessarily have the training in corporate governance and what they should watch out from a way of fiduciary obligations. Hmm. 
Okay. Chris Kopala Krishnan, that's, that's an interesting uh, point to pick up on the point that was being made there by Alok Mittal, the role of private equity, especially the role of private equity when it comes to uh, being on the board of uh, companies that they invest in, and also to put in place a mechanism where, as Alok was pointing out, the entrepreneur doesn't find himself or herself being uh, overexposed to the downside uh, of risk-taking. See, this all starts with the agreement that you sign. And um, what we are trying to do, you know, for example, at Confederation of Indian Industries, what we are trying to do at Axelor, etc., is put out templates for these agreements uh, so that it's balanced, so hmm. that it's fair to all parties concerned, and to, through, through hmm. seminars and things like that, educate um, both the founders as well as the investors that there has to be fairness in these agreements. Second is to um, actually have the support system that's necessary um, to ensure that, um, you know, there is, when, when things become difficult, when things are not going too well, of course, transparency we already talked about, but reaching out to people who understand, who can actually step in and maybe negotiate mm. for you. Uh, I think that's also very, very important, mm. that support system uh, you know, mentors or other people who can step in, who can help these people, help uh, the founders, help the CEO uh, to negotiate. And I've seen many cases where, um, you know, the negotiations have gone through well, they've renegotiated the agreements and things go forward and turn around and everybody is happy uh, at the end. Okay. You know, many of the hmm. um, cases, hmm. you know, there have been successful um, further rounds of uh, investment and things like that. You know, we go through a mezzanine round and then next round mm. things become better. Mm. So there are ways in which you know, this can happen within the four walls of the industry and that's what we need to try and do. Mm. Okay, uh, Gopal and uh, Paddy, I'm going to get both of you to comment on uh, what you just said there from Chris Gopal Krishnan. You know, uh, since we've been talking about the various uh, uh, pools of, uh, of capital that are available, venture, private equity, venture debt, hybrid instruments, uh, uh, promoter funding, and I would imagine that there's, uh, you know, beyond the asymmetry of information, uh, there's also a lot of confusion. So can we have, uh, you know, market standards, as Alok was pointing out, templatized agreements, uh, you know, being offered a support network uh, to really help people negotiate some of these complexities. Gopal, I'll start by asking you. I think, Shireen, there is a very developing and rich ecosystem in this country of bankers, investment bankers, lawyers, angel investors who act as mentors, wonderful organizations like Thai, and associations like CII and IVCA which actually try very hard to provide this. For example, when the unfortunate incident of a startup entrepreneur not keeping his, paying his liabilities in Bangalore that he referred to, IVCA came out with a governance template saying that VCs must be more active on the boards when they are cognizant of over trading by the company. So we are all making these efforts constantly mm. to make it happen. But mm. what I would say is, ultimately this is a bilateral arrangement between the business promoter, the entrepreneur, the founder and the investor on the yeah. other side. Yeah. And it's best that while everybody develops mm. this community of networks to support them, their advisors to support them, ultimately mm. it's bilateral and we should not do anything that which will interfere in mm. uh, the market forces operating the way they should operate within the laws of the land. We recently had the Prime Minister tell us that one law should apply throughout the country. I would say we have one set of laws which govern yeah. the way corporates function, tax functions, regulators functions across the country. And we should learn to manage in a very high risk because we are like this raft as I mentioned in white water. In this raft we should still operate within mm. the laws of this mm. country with advisors and good ecosystems. Not well, uh, no one is suggesting laws. that you don't operate with. <laughs> no one is suggesting you don't operate within the laws of this uh, <laughs> of this country. But, but, uh, Paddy, just uh, sure. you know, just just to take that point forward. No, I'm just saying uh, that you know, enough, what are the big pain of good points the that you're works to work with today? I, I, I get, I, I get that. I get that. That we don't we don't need any any more. Uh, but, Paddy, just to take sure. that point forward on what, what yeah. are the specific pain points that you're seeing within the ecosystem when it comes to funding, when it comes to
negotiating terms. Uh, when it comes to exit, where clearly there seems to be pain, even though the last two, three years have been better from an exit point of view. Uh, and that, if you go by the recent uh, unfortunate episode, that's where the pressure seems to be piling up. Uh, you know, what would you be mindful of? So, Shireen, I've been seeing this for a couple of decades and I started off as an internet entrepreneur uh, on the other side with PEVC and then, you know, as a private equity investor. I actually think the Indian system has become much more sophisticated over the last couple of decades. Uh, promoters have a much better understanding of what uh, value uh, private equity adds to the business and how to operate and, you know, the uh, institutionalization and professionalization that they can do alongside these investors. Uh, I, I have a very different perspective on this templatization. It's, you can't templatize uh, a yeah. relationship like this. It's about chemistry. It's like saying you have a template for a marital relationship. You know, ultimately it's four to six years or sometimes, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes longer of, uh, of living together. Uh, you've got to understand, you've got to select your partners correctly. You, as a private equity investor or venture capital investor, you've got to find the founders who will be transparent, who will be open to thick and thin. Uh, you know, you actually become mm. on their boards a kind of buddy to them. It is a lonely uh, journey as an entrepreneur building out a business. Nothing ever works to perfection, particularly not in an emerging uh, market or a country yeah. like India. Uh, uh, but you are in it together and ultimately the goal is common uh, to make mm. a sustainable, valuable business. Mm. And the entrepreneur understands that mm. the private equity uh, partner is a long-term mm. partner but eventually needs to exit. I think uh, mm. in my 18 mm. years as a private equity investor with Indian and foreign firms, I don't recall a single exit which was through a, yeah. a, you know, it's a fair, fairly long period which was through a put to the promoter. And yeah. I, 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 I do think uh -huh. that the relationship uh, and even as, a, uh, even as an internet entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, you know we, mm. we did manage to, of course, one learning was even though uh, you know, we managed to raise more than $10 million uh, just before the dot-com bust and that really helped us go through it and, and eventually sell to a strategic. But the venture capital investors were, mm. were sort of our buddies uh, and helped us and supported us through the journey. Mm. So I, I don't think templatization mm. is any sort of solution. Of course, you should mentor people. You should make them understand okay. what they are signing up for. Uh, and as you know, sure. as, as Gopal mentioned, even the in, uh, Industry Venture Capital Association does that. But uh, you can't have templates. It's about yeah. then finding the right partners and living through the journey. It's about. It's about finding the right partners uh, and forging that bilateral arrangement. Uh, uh, Punita, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, and I would come back again to the point that I raised with Ravi. Uh, is there a fear, um, and I don't know whether it's a legitimate fear or not, but is there a fear that we could perhaps see some heavy-handed regulation coming in, uh, which no longer makes this as bilateral an arrangement as you would like it to be? I think I agree with uh, Paddy that um, you know uh, every relationship is a customized relationship, and uh, I think the you know basic tenets of every relationship where you know you respect each other, you empathize with each other, you are transparent, and you have open communication channels, um, and understand each other's uh, you know uh, long-term intent. Uh, so I think if you have those things in place. Uh, you know, the relationship is likely to be much uh, stronger and much better. And I think most importantly, uh, at least what we have uh, seen when we took private equity capital, is that sometimes we are too close to, to a mm. situation and we are, uh, you know, very passionate about a particular point of view. But somebody who is a little far away and not mm. that day-to-day -day involved can see, uh, you know, another point of view which uh, you as an entrepreneur sometimes may miss. And I will give a classic example of, uh, uh, you know, in our case, when we were working with KKR, we, uh, before KKR, it was all organic yeah. growth. And post KKR, it was mostly inorganic growth. And, um, you know, KKR suggested to us that you should make two teams, one which argues for the deal and one which argues against the deal. And then you can, uh, you know, see the opportunity mm. on one hand, risks on another hand, and then you can make a decision. And sometimes, you know, if you know risks up front, you can think of creative ways to mitigate those risks and then assume those risks only mm. which you are comfortable with. So I think this was a great process 
which we uh, you know did not have so much sophistication in our MNA process. And this, if you apply this kind of thing, it uh, you know you tend to make less mistakes and you tend to uh, you know uh, yeah. forecast various scenarios which you can be prepared for. So I think uh, you know uh, entrepreneurs have a lot of uh, a passion and a lot of uh, optimism, but private equity. Uh, also has the same alignment of interest to build a valuable and sustainable business, but uh, you know they can help out because they are not so close to the situation. So I think both people have value to add, and um, if you trust each other, if you have good communication, yeah. I think you can benefit tremendously from this relationship. So I think the second point you made was about fear I'm of uh, regulation and a knee-jerk reaction. I personally think that uh, uh, you know. Private equity is one of the cleanest capitals, uh, cleanest form of capital and risk and patient capital, which India uh, desperately needs as it uh, you know goes to a, on the road to five trillion. So personally, I don't think mm. uh, I think uh, our regulators are mature enough to uh, see that uh, this is not something which creates a knee-jerk reaction. I don't think anybody has done anything wrong here. Uh, you know, uh, if there is a contract and the contract is being discussed there is nothing wrong with that uh, and I think uh, you know if people have been in a relationship for five to six years typically that should uh, you know be a good relationship and um, I would personally not I, I don't have any fear of uh, you know punishing uh, you know capital which is required so much in India but I want to add one point related to income tax and uh, you know tax related issues I think one of the things which, which is of concern and which needs to be examined, you know, I've heard many times that, uh, hmm. uh, you know, income tax people have tax targets. And I just don't understand how you can give a target yeah. to somebody on tax collection. So I think uh, this is an area which needs to be examined, whether this target thing is true. Huh. Uh, and I think uh, the way to look it's forward true. to this it's is totally that yes, true. we should become Puneet. a... Puneet, Puneet, Puneet. Yeah. There, there. There, so, is, there, is no, there is no dispute on that. It's absolutely true. The income tax department is given a target. It's given in the budget every year. So there's absolutely no sort of uh, speculation or rumor about that. That's so absolutely I, true. So I think this needs to be corrected. I would personally say the only way to, uh, you know, uh, increase taxation is increase, level, I mean, increase collections is improve the level of compliance and create enablers to grow the economy. Yeah. As the pie grows, as compliance increases, uh, you know, uh, tax collection yeah. will automatically go up. But giving targets to people, quarterly, monthly yeah. targets, that creates, to undue, uh, relate, that creates undue pressure on the ground. And that is certainly not a desirable situation yes. in an entrepreneurially uh, intense economy. And I think the last point I want to make on this, oh. uh, you know, tax-related uh, uh, issue is that I think... Uh, this is something which requires a wider debate as to why there is so much trust deficit in India. I think the uh, you know hmm. uh, people who in, uh, create compliance and entrepreneurs. I think there has to be a way by hmm. which you can communicate, where you can discuss problems, and uh, you know a transparent system yeah. has to be created. And if there is non-compliance, then uh, justice needs to be speedily dispensed. It cannot take like 15 years with, you know, Sorry. multiple rounds of litigation Sorry. and in, you know, most of the cases you, Sorry. the assessee wins. So I think this is something which is required where trust yeah. deficit needs to be reduced and justice needs to be speedily dispensed so that entrepreneurial energy is focused on creating business and, um, you know, uh, the taxman's time is, uh, you know, uh, spent on just compliance and simplicity rather than complexity and litigation. Uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've raised many valid points there, uh, Puneet Dalmia, especially on income tax and the manner in which uh, uh, the, the relationship between income tax and assessees in this country and this business of moving away from tax targets has been a long-standing demand of Indian industry. In fact, as we speak today, uh, you know, on this angel tax issue, the end circular being issued uh, by the CBDT, and I'm hoping that with this, this matter will finally come to a close, but, uh, uh, but you know, the, the friction and the pain
pain points when it comes to tax related matters uh, continue but uh, let me get wrap up comments from each of you and Ravi Guru Raj I'll start by asking you because you know each one of us has spoken about uh, how we need to move away from this mindset of uh, of demonizing business failure uh, of not stigmatizing business failure share with us uh, one of your own personal stories uh, of a hardship that you went through, of a failure that you saw and overcame. And I think that would be important for each one of you to do here uh, with our audience, uh, that it is hard. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of pressure, there's pain, uh, things don't always go your way, but there are ways to be able to cope with that and ride through the storm. Ravi, I'll start with you. Sure. So, you know, I think any entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur six times, right? This is my sixth startup. I think, you know, when you're employee number zero, that is the founder of the company, it's a very lonely spot to be, right? It's an exciting spot, but also there are so many risks. There are so many unknowns. There's so much ambiguity. Uh, you know, you're going out for an opportunity, but you're not sure the exact journey you're going to take, the exact path you're going to take, who's going to back you. Uh, you know, so there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey that's for very few people, I'd say. You know, the, I always counsel folks who come to me and say, I want to do a startup. I say, you know, go work at a startup, watch founders trying to build companies, uh, get a feel for how, how hard that journey is and how many ups and downs you'll go through before you jump in. I think, you know, that's, a, that's the kind of internship you need before you say, I want to be a founder, right? Uh, I think just in terms of failures, I think entrepreneurship is this constant, you're in constant failure mode till you achieve success. And even after you achieve success, you're now again challenged yeah. with the next goal. And so you're back again in that cycle of constantly fearing failure, right? Or whatever the next goal is. And I think that's a natural state to be in. So I think yeah. what entrepreneurs need to do is separate the business from the personal. I think they, they should be emotional about their business, mm. but they shouldn't let it overwhelm them, right? Uh, mm. To the point of capitulation, personal capitulation, mm. right? Uh, I think they need to mm. figure out where mm. to draw the lines between what's business, what comes home, make sure they find a balance between the two and understand yeah. that there will be constantly pressures and, you know, the, you know, the opportunity both to succeed and the risk of failure, right? Will be, have to be balanced yeah. in your life as you go forward, uh, you know, because you're Absolutely. often doing something that nobody else has done. You're often take, trying to crack a new market. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, in my own case, you know, there have been times when you know, businesses, even when you have a ex successful exit, you're always saying, should I bat on further, right? Because there's a decision point at every business when you either you sell it yeah. to somebody else, uh, you decide to fold because your, your opportunity cost is greater, right, to continue in what you're doing. Uh, and, yeah. you know, so I think, you know, entrepreneurs just have to be very optimistic on the one hand and pragmatic on the other, right, <laughs> in terms of uh, setting their own expectations. Okay, uh, balance, I'd say, you know, balance I'd counsel between entrepreneurs, optimism to scenario and out everything that might yeah. happen yeah 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 and that was the point that Puneet was making as well balance between optimism and pragmatism Chris Gopalakrishnan a failure that you had to deal with and overcome so in, in the last five years since I've been investing in the startup ecosystem uh, you know early on you will only see failures right we want companies to fail fast so uh, as we discuss with the founding team and as we look at their plans etc one key question we ask always is about cash flow because if you run out of cash that's mm. when you know things uh, go south so at that point <clears throat> you know yeah there's a there's an important discussion to have you know should you actually shut down and go forward you know how do you take care of the employees that you have right. and this is a discussion that we have we handhold them sometimes we uh, tell them how to do this mm. Um, mm. in a legally uh, and as well as in a in a manner in which is as painless as possible it's a very painful process but as painless as possible and i've seen yeah. multiple of these things uh, this is something you know as an investor i i see now and i i try to help out as much as possible hopefully some of the investments that are still left will make up for these failures 
All right, uh, gentlemen, unfortunately, we've come to the end of this very special program. Uh, uh, you know, on the basis of the conversation that we've had, I've been able to put together uh, what I believe are the crucial uh, five C's. Uh, uh, it's imperative to focus on getting the chemistry right between the entrepreneur and the investor, and that, of course, is the starting point. Collaboration, that's the second. You need to have an alignment of interest and hence uh, a partnership and a collaboration that is deep. Uh, compliance, you have to comply with uh, with the disclosure norms, with the regulatory norms that ensure uh, that you are uh, communicating, that's the other C, communicating not just with your investor but with all of your stakeholders, what the vision is, what's gone wrong, what's uh, good and what the road ahead is. And finally, the focus needs to be on cash flow. And I think uh, uh, those I would uh, summarize uh, the discussion that we've had over the last 60 minutes are going to be essential uh, to build out the Indian startup ecosystem even further. There is plenty uh, to learn from the experience over the last 10 years or so. Private equity and venture capital is important if we want to continue to grow and build out this ecosystem, but we need to ensure that there are guardrails in place so that we don't have a situation of uh, over-leveraging, we don't have a situation of an asymmetry of negotiations and contracts. Chris Kopalakrishnan, Alok Mittal, Ravi Gururaj, Puneet Dalmia, Paddy and uh, Mr. Srinivasan, thanks very much for joining us here on this Young Turk special on the private equity landscape and the road ahead. We'll wrap things up here. Don't go anywhere. The news continues.